service off with called I Am Blessed. And unfortunately, we're not blessed enough to have it in your folder yet. So you just going to have to sing with me the best that you can. Amen. Everybody say, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to pray it's blessed. And I'm going to let God take care of the rest. All right. Let's do it. I am blessed. Did y'all hear about that? They threatened. They threatened the whole church of God. This is what God 
have any trouble. This is in Acts chapter 4, and this is what the disciples prayed after the leaders of the church at the time had threatened them to never preach in the name of Jesus again. It's Acts chapter 4, and it's verse 29 through 31. And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they preached the word of God with boldness. Do you think that one knucklehead who, who leaks a memo can stop what God's doing? No, he can't. All right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to thank God today, and we're going to celebrate today, because we're celebrating a win. Because no matter what anybody does, and no matter what anybody tries, God is greater. And he said, my grace it uh, always outpaced sin. He said, where sin abounds, what happens with grace? Grace much more abounds. So I'm praying God's grace much more abounds in this situation and all around the world today as churches have been threatened and that their threats will come to naught. Can everybody agree with that? Say amen. amen. All right, let's sing it. 203. <laughs>
is so good, let's go ahead and receive the offering. How about that? I'm going to ask Brother Don, would you come and receive the offering for us this morning? Oh, 
us get around folks and give somebody a big old high five this morning. Tell them happy Mother's Day. Give them a big old hug. Tell them how good they look. Okay? Tell them all the ladies how sweet they look this morning. Let's have some fellas here.
house and you turn him into a totally different person. So, you know, that's not something that happens here very much because that anointing is not that needed in this situation because right now the Lord's got us in a teaching mode. But there's a reason for it because he's sowing seed and laying, laying foundation in y'all that, that needs to be laid because he's building us up to a level of where we're going to be able to handle the persecution that's coming. But no one wants to talk about persecution on Mother's Day. But I want you to understand, look at the signs of the times. If they're willing to threaten the churches over our stance on abortion, what else are they going to threaten them? Okay? So we have to be ready. We have to be ready to meet people at the door. We have to be ready to fight for what we believe in. And we have to fight the fight of faith for it. But we have to understand, sometimes you have to fight physically. Yeah. And the disciples went through it. They fought. They had to fight. And they had to stand there with boldness and say things that was very unpopular. But God said, he said, I will confirm my word. He said, I'll work with my word. I will confirm my word with signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen? And that's what I'm praying for. That God will confirm his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. So, that being said, I'm going to give you, I'll give you a, a quick testimony of one. My wife was out last week because we thought she had several different things happen. She spent some time in the emergency room. Uh, Monday, come to find out, she got shingles. Anybody ever had shingles? It sucks. Okay? Don't it? Okay. And so what we prayed, I said, Lord, what? I felt so bad for her. I, I had compassion over her. I said, Lord, what do I need to pray? He said, pray that I'll take the sting out of those shingles. I said, okay. So that night, I prayed over her, and I said, Lord, take the sting out of those shingles. What happened, then? I got up the next day, and it wasn't hurting anymore. Oh. No pain. She still got blisters. Yeah. No pain. No pain. It, it, it's not me. It ain't me. It's not me. It's him. Mm -hmm. He said he would confirm his word with what? Signs, miracles, and wonders. And that's what we got to pray for. And it ain't me. You could have prayed the same thing. And he'll confirm it because if you ask him, God, how should I pray? And he puts an idea on your heart how to pray, then pray that. Even if it sounds stupid, pray it. Because he'll confirm what he does by what he says. Amen? All right, so here we are, the I Am In Me, part three. This is the last part of this, I believe, unless the Lord takes us one more one more part, and if he does, I'm happy with it. The I am in me, part three, and we're looking at Matthew 16 and 19, and here it is, a little bit different version to the New Living Version printed out in your notes, and it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Who is speaking here? Jesus. And Jesus is telling us, the church, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you what? Forbid. Say that again. Forbid. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you what? Forbid. Permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. A lot of the stuff that the church is going through right now is because we've been too lazy to forbid. Or too faithless to forbid. Or we didn't know we had the ability to do that. Or God's permission to do that. How do you forbid somebody? You tell them no. Well, tell the devil no. Tell him no. What did Jesus do to the winds and the waves? He told him, no, peace be still. When something's attacking you, tell it no in the name of Jesus. Get out. Okay? Can I tell you one more thing that God's telling me to tell you? And again, y'all know when I tell you things, I'm testifying this is what God does, it ain't what I do. Long time ago, God put it on my heart to be, to pay attention to the weather. And he proved this in one of the paper Bibles for me. Because if one of the temple Bibles, we had a storm come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad witnessed this. My wife witnessed this. This storm, I mean, come up big time. And it was shaking the tents about. I saw fear in people's faces. And God said, if you, said to me, he said, if you don't do something about this, you're going to lose them. I said, okay, what do I do? He said, tell them, tell them the wind and the, and the, the rain. Tell, tell the wind and the storm to stop. Peace be still. And I spoke to it in front of everybody. Looking like a fool. And I spoke to the winds and the storm. And I told it to peace be still. What happened? Stop. It wasn't me. What did I do? I obeyed him. Okay? So we have to understand, if we do what God tells us to do, he's going to confirm it with signs, wonders, and miracles. And it's not the preacher. It's anybody. Because Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. Say it again. Believe. 
Not that's called to preach, those that believe. All you've got to do is believe. Yeah. Believe that what God tells you to do, he will do it. Amen? But you have to speak it. So he said, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Pray about something that's bothering you and ask God, what do I say? What do I do? He may tell you, speak to it. If he says it, don't be afraid. Speak to it. Listen, if you do what God tells you to, isn't it up to him to make it work? Okay. So if it don't work, it's on him. Somebody chuckled at it. That's what faith says. Faith is bold enough to say, God, I'll say it, but if it don't work, it's on you. I told him that. Okay? And I'm still here. He didn't strike me down with lightning. All right? So you've got to have that kind of faith that just says, God, if you tell me to do it, I'm just going to be dumb enough to do it. But I'm trusting you to make the outcome come out the way you want, you want it to. So, look at John 1. Excuse me, 1 John 4. He said, here there's our love made perfect, perfect, that we may have boldness. Everybody say boldness. Oh, he wants us to be bold. Because as Jesus says, so I am in this world. I am from and of God. Because the one who's in me is greater than the one who's in the world. Amen? Amen. All right, so look at the rest of this. Taking on the nature of God. This is what happens when the I am is in me. Let's turn to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Get in the old covenant. Get back in the back of the beginning. Exodus 33, we're going to start with verse 7. Of course, we're reading out of the New Living this morning. Verse 7 reads, It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting. The old, the, the King James calls it the tabernacle. To take the tent of meeting or the tabernacle and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Verse 8. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. Verse 9, as he went into the tent, the pillar of the cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Verse 10, when the Lord saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Verse 11, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would... Read this out loud with me. Everybody, ready, read. Speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Now, Heavenly Father, we can't do anything without you, and we will not presume to be able to. So we can't even hear your word without your anointing on our ears. So I'm asking you that you will manifest anointing in our ears. Give us your ears to hear as you do. Your eyes to see as you do. Your anointed mind, Jesus, to think your anointed thoughts. And your godly and comprehensive heart that is governed by your love and filled with your nature. And help us to trust in you and to hear your word with ears to hear and receive it with gladness. And take it as the truth that exceeds all other facts and truth. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 God spoke to Moses face to face. I have to be honest with you. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. This thrills me more than anything. Verse 11 says, Inside the tent of Eden, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And we have to understand that God came down in what? The pillar of of the cloud. Okay? So the pillar of the cloud came down and stood at the door of the tent. Moses is inside. So God's back, so to speak, was to everyone else. But God still covered in this cloud. Today we call it the smoke of wool. And so he's in this. So Moses is technically not seeing God's face. Because you'll find out as we read on in, in the rest of it that God told Moses he can't look at his face. Because Moses was in a sinful state. Okay? 
Now, keep your finger right there or take something out of the front of the bench and put it there as a placeholder in Exodus 33. So we're going to come right back to it. But I want you to turn to the next scripture that's in your notes, 2 Corinthians 3. So don't lose your place in Exodus 33. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, all the way to in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, 2 Corinthians comes after 1 Corinthians. Just so I can help you out a little bit. I just want to be a blessing this morning. <laughs> There's no shame in looking in the index, I promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1, and it's kind of a weird place to start. You think verse 1 will be right, a good place to start. But we're starting kind of in the middle of a conversation that Paul is having in a letter. And he's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. And we're starting in kind of a middle part of his conversation. Because you've got to remember that all these New Testament, all these New Testament books were actually letters. And Paul was the hardest one to translate because he didn't use any punctuation. He didn't break it down in paragraphs. Paul wrote and just, he wrote one string of writing. Okay, so it was difficult for them to break it down. So they had to put numbers in places sometimes that didn't feel right. So this is why it seems weird. As we start, it says, are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others who need to bring you letters of recommendation or who ask, to write, or ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. Verse 2. The only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Verse 3. Clearly you are a letter from Christ, showing the result of our ministry from you. Say, my life is a letter. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on what? Human. Human heart. God said that he would write his word. He promised Moses this. He said, I'm going to write the word on the hearts of the people. It's not going to be just written in stone. And see, what we read about in Exodus 33 is right before Moses went up to talk with God and for him to write the Ten Commandments. The original Ten Commandments, the first tablets of stone, God wrote the words himself on the stone. He had Moses chisel the stones out. Moses brought the stones to God up on the mountain in his presence, and God wrote the words himself. But what did Moses do with it? He got mad and he broke it. Now, he was justified in being mad. He wasn't justified in breaking it. So the second tablets, God told Moses, do it again. But the second time, guess who had to write them themselves? <laughs> Moses did. Moses had to write them himself. He did, God didn't write He said, you're going to write it this time, boy. You broke it. All right? So, now we got to look at this. The Spirit of God writes the Word of God on our hearts. Look at verse 4. We are confident of all this because our great trust in God through Christ it's not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from who? God. From God. He has enabled us to be ministers of this new covenant. This is a covenant wrought not written, not of written laws, but it's a covenant of what? Spirit. The Spirit. The new covenant is a covenant of the Spirit. It's not written laws like the covenant of Moses. The old written covenant ends in what? But under the new covenant, the Spirit gives what? Yeah. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. Verse 7, the old way with laws etched on stone lead to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. When Moses came down from the mountain after receiving the tablets and the written law, his face was glowing with the presence of God so much that it freaked the people out. And they said, Moses, put a bell on your face. We can't stand it. You're glowing. 
And so he crafted a veil and wore a veil over his face so that it would cover up the glory of God because it was freaking the people out. Read it. It's in Exodus 35, I think. 34, 35. Next verse. Excuse me, we're still in this verse. For the face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Verse 8. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Question mark. Yes, we should. Verse 9. If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us what? Wow. Say that again. The new covenant. The glory of God, the blood of Jesus Christ makes you and me right with God. If you've been born again, you can say it. I'm right with God. Well, I made mistakes. It doesn't matter. Blood of Jesus. When you made that mistake or when you said, did you confess it to God? Did you ask him to forgive you? Well, if you did, guess what? His blood cleanses it as if it never happened. So you're right with him. It's that easy. God makes us right with him. And he'll maintain our righteousness as long as we maintain our integrity and confess our sins. So when the Holy Spirit tweaks you and says, ah, you should have done that, confess his sin, God, I'm sorry, I should have done that, please forgive me, wash me in your blood, it's that quick, we're done. God says, what sin? It's like it never happened. Everybody understand this? Yes. That's how easy it is. Don't let the devil trick you in any other way. We are righteous before God. We are right with him. Amen. All right, verse 10. In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way, which we're living in now. Verse 11. So if the old way had been replaced with glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Verse 12. Since this new way gives us such what? Confidence. We can have confidence. God even invited us. He said, come boldly before the throne of grace. And receive help and grace in your time of need. He invites us. Even when we mess up. Come boldly before the throne of grace. He'll give us grace for that screw up. He said don't worry about it. For Jesus knows everything we're going through. He went through it himself. Amen? Amen. So he invites us to come boldly. Don't feel like God's mad at you. He wants you to come. He wants you to come and, and, and come to him. And this is what we have to understand. Just to hold your place right there in verse 12. Let me preach to you just for a moment. Because this is what God laid my, on my heart about Mother's Day. One of the greatest, other than, okay, I say it like this. Kids are like boats. What's the two greatest days of a boat owner's life? Day you buy it, day you sell it. Okay? The two greatest days in a parent's life is the day they're born and the day they move out of the house. Blake keeps looking at his mom and she's just straight. She won't, no, she, she won't amen that at all. And she's looking at her. Here's, here's the point I'm trying to make. The greatest time I've had in my life as a parent has been when my kids have finally become adults. The reason why is because now they understand some of the stuff we go through. They can relate it's hard for a parent to be completely friends with their child as long as their child is under age. Because sometimes we still have to be the parent. Amen? And the child don't always understand that. But once a child gets to be an adult, and they can have adult problems and adult situations, then we get to foster something that's known as the friendship. Where we as parents can be friends with our children, and our children can be friends with us. Amen? And we can relate to each other, not only as mom and dad and, and son and daughter, but we can relate as friends. Because let me tell you something about God being your heavenly father. When you're going through things on earth that you don't know how to handle, Jesus says, come boldly before the throne of grace. You can come to him and say, I'm the father of Jesus. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm looking and going through something I don't know how to handle. How did you handle it when you were on the earth? Let me tell you something. They'll share with you how they handle it. They'll give you peace in that time. 
They'll give you instructions. They'll give you help. They'll give you comfort. That's what they want us to do is to be friends with them. To not just have this God relationship and I'm just down here on the earth and I'm just a, a, an old sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. If you're born again, you're no longer a sinner saved by grace. And God's inviting us to be his friend. He wants us to have that friendship with him. Not just as having the attitude as a child. That's what Jesus said if we're going to enter into the kingdom. But Paul said we're going to get to a point where we no longer drink milk. Where we eat meat and we grow out of childish things. And we can relate to God and we can relate to Jesus and the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit as not only God but our friends as well. And we can have fellowship with Him. That's what they desire. Amen? Amen. And if you know what's good for you, that's what you'll desire. Because your relationship with God knows no bounds once you become to the point where you realize He wants you to be friends with Him. That's when it explodes into amazing grace. Not just grace, it's amazing grace. Amen? Amen. Everybody with me? Yeah. So this is where we, we look forward to the day when we can become friends with our kids and our kids can be friends with us. But God looks forward to the day when we can become friends with Him and be like Moses and not be afraid to look God face to face and say, I want to be friends with you. And don't be afraid to tell God how you feel. So a lot of times God's heard me complain. I've told him how I feel. I've told him when it's good and when it ain't no good. And I'm still here. He ain't struck me down yet. Amen? Amen? God wants to know. He said, bring everything. How many times do we sing, bring all your cares and burdens to me? That's what he said. It's small or large, it doesn't matter. He's been through it all. He knows how to get us through it. Somebody say he's a good friend. Good friend. Look at verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We're not like Moses who put a bell over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away, verse 14. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is read, the same bell covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this bell can be removed only by what? Once you believe in Christ, the bell is gone. Verse, uh, verse 15. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that bell and they don't understand. 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the bell is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. freedom. Somebody say freedom. Freedom. So, verse 18. All of us who have had the bell removed can see and what? Reflect. Reflect. The glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us what? More and more like Him. Everybody say, I want to be like Him. As we are changed into this glorious image. Now turn back to Exodus 33. Go back to Exodus 33. And let's go down. Go to verse 18. Verse 18. Moses responded, Then show me your glorious presence. Verse 19. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. Yahweh or Jehovah. I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Verse 20. But you may not look directly at my face. For no one can see me and live. Why? Because they didn't have righteousness. God has given us righteousness now by his blood. Amen? Because didn't we just read he makes us right with him? And when we're right with him, we can come boldly before the throne of grace and we can look at Jesus face to face. Amen? We don't have to worry about his glory striking us down because now we can see and reflect. Remember we just read that. We can see and reflect his glory. Moses couldn't see the glory of God's face. We can because of the righteousness of God in Christ. Because we're in him and his righteousness is in us. Which keeps us from being struck down by his glory. Amen? Amen. Look at what it says here. Verse 21. The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. I want you to look at that in the King James. Verse 21 of King James. 
And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place, what? By me. By me. There's a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock. Well, who's by of the Father? Who's at his right hand? Jesus, Jesus is. Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus is. So look what happened. Verse 21 in the New Living. Look, stand near me on this rock. Verse 22, as my glorious presence passes by, I will what? Hide you in the crevice of the rock. Who is the rock? Jesus. Who are we hiding in? Jesus. And he said, I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind it. But my face will not be seen. Now that we are in Christ, we have equal access to Abba Father as Jesus does. There's no difference. We can come boldly before him to the throne of grace without worrying about his glory striking us down when we look at it. Amen? Amen? We can say, Lord, I want to see your glory. And he will oblige us. He will show us his glory. People always say, how do I know? You, you say all the time, you hear the Lord say, you hear the Lord speak to you. How do you know the Lord's speaking to you? Because Jesus said, when he speaks, I'll leave you with what? Peace. When Jesus speaks to me, peace happens. If it ain't Jesus, there ain't no peace. So I know the difference. Because if it's some harebrained idea I had, or some thought that I had, or something Satan put in my heart, there ain't going to be no peace there at all. Because when Jesus speaks peace, he said, my peace I will leave you, and it won't be the peace that the world gives. He distinguished it. He said, the world gives you a false peace. I'm going to give you authentic peace that will give you peace that what? Passes all understanding. So you'll, God can tell you something that blows your mind that you don't understand, but he leaves you such peace. You're like, that's got to be God. Even though I don't understand it, it's got to be God. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Everybody okay? Amen. So we have to understand that he gives us peace. Why? Because we have the righteousness of God in Christ, and we can have boldness to approach him, and we can see him face to face, and we can hear his voice and not be worried about death like they were back in Moses' day. We have a different and a new and a better covenant. A new covenant. Amen? All right, now let's look. Look at your notes. James 1, 22 through 25 says, But be doers of the word. So we're reading out of the notes. This is in the Amplified. So I printed it in the notes for you. Be doers of the word. Obey the message. We can't just hear it. We've got to be obedient. And not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. So if a thought comes in your mind that's different than what God tells you, get rid of it. Verse 23. For any, if anyone listens to the word only without obeying it, being a doer, and being a doer of it, he is like a man who looks carefully at his own natural face in a mirror, for he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. Verse 25. But he who looks carefully at the faultless law, the law of what? Liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. He is a faith, and he's faithful to it, and perseveres looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he shall be blessed in his doing, his life of obedience. Here's the one thing God wants us to understand. When you take the Bible that you're holding in your hands, and you discipline yourself to get in that Bible once a day, I'm going to tell you, if you're not in it once a day, you're missing out. I'm not trying to beat you over the head with the Bible. I'm just telling you, you're missing something. Amen? Yeah. I'm not trying to convict you or anything. I'm just saying, look, you're missing something. Don't you hate feeling like you've missed something you could have had for free? Yeah. Anybody ever have that sensation? Somebody says, hey, they're having a sale over at the store, and they were giving away so-and-so, and the first 50, the first 50 people in line got one for free. And you're like, man, I wish I'd known. I could have got it for free. You know that feeling in your gut that she says, I wish I could have got it for free. Amen? Yeah. Well, this is the thing I'm trying to help you understand. You're missing out on something greater than getting the two-for-one special for free. 
You're missing out on face time with Jesus if you don't get into the Word at least once a day. Because that's when God begins to change us. And we begin to look like Jesus. Remember what we just read in 2 Corinthians towards the end in verse 18, 17, 18? He said that he, will, he changes us to be more and more like Him as we look into the perfect law of liberty. Remember that? We just read it. What is the perfect law of liberty? It's right here. When you're, especially in the New Covenant, when you're reading out of the New Covenant, you're reading out of that New Covenant, which is the law of liberty. It's the perfect law of liberty. And we're patterning our life out of what we see. Why? Because the New Covenant is the pattern of Jesus. It's the Word. It is Jesus. And we're reading it, and the more you read it, the more you become like Him. The more you receive it and believe it, the more you hear it, the more you become like Him. The more you have face time with Him, the more you're treating Him like He's a friend. And you're talking to Him, and you're listening for Him to talk back, and you're waiting for Him to speak to you. And you hear His still, small voice, and it gives you peace. You become more and more like He is. Because finally, you're beginning to have a conversation with God. Amen? And I'm telling you, there's nothing that thrills me more than to sit in a quiet place and to hear that still small voice in my heart where I know it's God speaking to me. I'm going to tell you something funny God said to me a while back. I got that Chevrolet diesel truck. And I had to pull out in front of somebody. And I pulled out, and I didn't realize I pulled out in front of them. When I pulled, I pulled out on Cleveland Highway from... Uh, um, the, the, what's the name of that store road? Jim Hood, Jim Hood Road. So I pulled out of Jim Hood Road and pulled, and I didn't realize, I saw the corner of my eye, somebody come barreling around that curve. I mean, they had to be doing 70. They come barreling around, and I saw them getting bigger in my rearview mirror. Anybody know that feeling? Yeah. And I walked down on that throttle, and that truck took off, and I gained on it. I outrun. And you know what come up in my spirit? I was the Holy Spirit. If I'm standing here, it was the Holy Spirit that said, Son, it's all good in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> and I did the same thing. Yeah, I busted out laughing. I busted out laughing. I started laughing. I said, Yes, sir, it's all good in the hood. Amen. It's all good. He said, Under the hood. It's all good under the hood. It's all good under the hood. Even God knows how to joke about a truck. He wouldn't have said that about a fool. <laughs> Forgive me, brother. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. All right. You got to make everybody mad when you preach it. Come on. Everybody with me? Yeah. And see, that's the thing. When, when I, I, I have those moments of my life, it ain't every single day that something like that happens, but God will speak to me in a way that just I know that he's my friend and he relates just to my everyday life. And he speaks to all of us that way, but you may not be tuned in enough to understand that Tim talking. You got to pay attention to the peace. But I'm going to tell you, the more that you get in this, the more you discipline yourself to say, God, I may not understand everything I'm reading, but I want, to, I want to have some time with you this morning or afternoon or whatever your time is, and I want to get along with you, and I want to hear from you. He'll help you to understand. You'll get some understanding. Okay? Take it a day at a time. But let him reveal himself to you and show you how much of a friend he can be to you. Because trust me, there are times when you really need that friendship with God. There are times of loss. There are times of distress. There are times when our life feels like we're coming apart. There are times when we need His touch in our body, and we need that friendship. And Satan will do his best to distract us where we think he ain't nowhere around when he's right here. And he's just as much a friend then as he is in the times when he says it's all good. Amen? Yeah. He is. He's the same. And he's not mad at you for what you did yesterday. He already paid the price for that. Just confess it. Thank you for forgiving and go on. Amen? Let's close it out. Colossians 3. Go back to the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, 
start in verse 10, excuse me, verse 10 out of the New Living. Everybody say, say amen. amen. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. Does anybody, does it feel hot in here? Is it stuffy or muggy? Okay, because I always get to this point and I feel like it's stuffy and muggy in here. So it's just me. All right. Do what now? Hey, that, that's because I preach like a thrashing machine, just like Papa Jim used to. All right. Verse 10. Put on your what? Amen. Say that again. Amen. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and what? Like Say that again. Like you should be grinning from ear to ear when you said that. Because you can learn to know him and become like him. You can put it on. Now, put it on don't mean fake it till you make it. I don't know who coined that phrase, but I like it. Give him a sock in the nose. Okay? Don't fake it till you make it. Be authentic. If you ain't making it, say it. God, I ain't making it. I need your help. Don't fake it. A lot of people die trying to make it till they make it. Fake it till they make it. Be authentic. Tell God what you need. He said, put on your new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Verse 12. Since God chose you. Say, God chose me. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must what? Forgive others. You know one of the reasons why there's so much enmity between people who are for abortion and the church? Because there's been so many churches who have protested at abortion centers. God never once in this entire word, I want you to show me where it is that he called us to protest. It ain't in there. I don't know. You know what he called us to do? Pray. You know what else he called us to do? Have compassion. You know what else he called us to do? To bring them love and not condemnation. The church has, not the church, but churches, churches, have brought condemnation to people in a time when they needed somebody to say, hey, we love you, and can we talk to you before you make this decision? See what I'm saying? We drop the ball many times. And we as a church can pray for people. Even if they're making decisions <laughs> that may be regret for the rest of their life. So he said, verse 12, clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, make allowance for each other's what? Oh. And forgive anyone who what? Trust me, sinners are going to act like sinners. They're going to be offensive. That's their nature. Amen? Forgive them. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with what? Love. Which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Turn the page. Let the message about Christ, what is that? The gospel, the word, in all its richness, fill your life. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing what? Psalms. Say it again. Psalms and what? Yeah. And what? Psalms. To God with thankful hearts. There's our formula for praise and worship. The formula for praise and worship for the New Testament church is this. Sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. So if we leave any of that out, we're not doing what God told us to do as a church. Amen? Yeah. That's why we haven't told away the number. And we ain't going. Songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Amen? And then he said, whatever you do, or say, what are we supposed to do? Do it as what? A representative of who? The Lord Jesus giving thanks to him through God the Father. Everything that we do, we have to do it as a representative to God. Now let's stand and let's come on down the road.
So it may be even weird. But I want you to understand, Jesus said, do this as often as you will. Yeah. He didn't command us and invite us. He invited us to come to the table and eat with him. And he found us. Amen? So if Jesus is going to make dinner for us, you better believe I'm going to be there. Amen? I spent uh, probably three hours yesterday making a giant pot of spaghetti sauce. I made some good sauce. Boy, I like it. I like it chunky for this stuff. You know? I don't like it just anyway. I'm not Italian. I'm American. I remember somebody told me one time, we're Americans. And Americans eat meat in their spaghetti.
and your word and your will. And they will also honor the constitutional values of our founding fathers. And they will understand that life is precious even in the womb. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you will manifest your grace in all our lives and help us to see that being with you every day, no matter how short or how long the time is, that you are transforming us into your likeness and making us like you and making us more and more godly and more and more like you so that we become like you and the world sees you in us and we do everything representing you. And we thank you for that. And Father, now we pray for every person represented in this box. Every name that's in this box is representing a great need. And we're asking you to touch each and every one of them. We know there are people that need heart transplants. There are people that need their life transformed. There are people that have gender confusion. There are people that are, that are struggling with, with debts and they're struggling with different things in their life. We're asking you to manifest yourself in their lives in ways which they never realized you could do. And we're asking you to work miracles in their lives which they're surprised. Give them surprises, Lord, that they never knew you could do something like this. And we pray that you open them up and wake them up and help them to know the truth and that the truth will make them free. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And we love you and we praise you and we give you glory. And everybody said amen. amen. Give everybody a big old hug and tell them how much you love them. And be dismissed. The blessing of the Lord be upon you.